In this video, we're going to take a look at working with the direct lighting kernel in Octane for Cinema 4D. And for this video, I'm using the Muscleship.C4D scene, which has this kind of spaceport setting and this kind of muscle car, hot rod spaceship uh, modeled by Jeffrey Homan for this series. And uh, we're just going to take a look at how the direct lighting kernel works and how to adjust its various settings. So I've actually put the Octane dialog docked up here and I've turned on the option for viewport rendering. So I'm rendering directly in the viewport as opposed to using the live viewer. Uh, so if I want to get to the settings, I'll click on this little gear icon. You can also find it by going to Octane settings right here, either way. And under the kernel tabs, I have this set to direct lighting. So here are my choices for um, rendering kernels. And we're going to have a movie on each one of these. So we're just going to start with direct lighting and uh, worry about these settings right here in this window. So direct lighting kernel uh, is a very nice, fast way to get a good looking render. It is not as physically accurate as the other lighting kernels. So it's not as physically accurate as path tracing or PMC. Uh, but it does get you to a result quicker. And it works well for scenes that don't have a whole lot of uh, like transparency or caustics or refractions, uh, which this scene is kind of a good example of. Most of the, uh, the materials in the scene are just straight up reflective metallic materials or glossy materials or diffuse materials with some emission on them. So it's not a very complicated scene in terms of the types of materials that it's using. So it's perfect for working with direct lighting. The first sample, of course, is the max sample setting, which I have set to 5000. Although for this scene, you could probably get away with a lower setting. So uh, just to sort of um, recap, the max samples setting uh, determines how long Octane is going to calculate until it is done. So if I set this to a million, then Octane is going to keep churning away the render until it hits that setting of a million, even though it might have looked just fine at say a thousand samples. So between a thousand samples and a million samples, you're kind of wasting resources if you set this too high. So you want to choose a value that is just high enough to get the result that you want. So even for this scene, 5,000 is a bit much, probably. We have to do some testing to find out. Every scene is going to be different. Let's set it down to a thousand for now. And uh, if I make like a camera change, it'll start calculating again. And you can see down here, we have the count of the samples, so it's, it's making its way up to a thousand. So if you pay attention to this and pay attention to the quality of the, of the render as the noise is eliminated, um, that will tell you what setting you need to set for this for your particular scene. So maybe this one could be a bit higher. However, a lot of the noise that you could see here on the ground could be eliminated by adjusting some of these other settings, which we'll get to in a minute. So the art of working with Octane is, of course, balancing render time with the settings, with eliminating the noise to get the result that you want. Below Max Samples, we have Global Illumination Mode. So three choices are None, Ambient Occlusion, and Diffuse. So this basically sets how the light that is bounced around in the scene off of various surfaces is calculated. Uh, ambient Occlusion is a nice, quick, dirty solution that uh, is the least physically accurate. GI Diffuse is a little bit more accurate, tends to be higher quality. I use the uh, GI Diffuse mode whenever I'm rendering with direct lighting, so I think it gives a better result. Uh, below this, we have the depth settings. So this determines how many times the lights bounce off of the surfaces back into the camera for each different type of reflection. So specular is for transparency, glossy is for reflective surfaces, and diffuse is for diffuse surfaces. So let's turn these all the way down to zero and you can start to get an idea of how they work. So you can see how the light is not really bouncing off of the surfaces very much. It doesn't look very realistic. Um, if I increase the diffuse depth, you can see the light bouncing off the diffuse parts of the surface a little bit more. But at a certain point, you know, the scene only requires so many bounces for it to look good. So if you set these too high, you might be wasting a lot of resources on processing that doesn't need to be done. Let's bring up the glossy surfaces so you can see there was reflections come in. So if I bring this really high, it's not going to really change the reflections very much. It's just going to slow down the render. So you want to put these to the 
lowest available or lowest possible settings to achieve the desired result. So in this scene, it seems like glossy depth four is plenty. If I move it above four, then I don't see much of a difference. And there's not a whole lot of transparent surfaces. Even the windshield on the spaceship here is more reflective than it is transparent. So you can get away with a very low specular depth in this scene. But if you have a lot of transparency, then you're going to want to increase this so that the light rays go through those transparent surfaces properly. I'll set this down to something like one for this scene. The ray epsilon setting uh, is useful for fixing artifacts that might occur in very large scenes. So when I'm talking about large, I mean large in terms of space. So if you're noticing, so if I bring this all the way down, you're going to start to see some artifacts down here. Like you can see the triangles, a little bit of weird shearing. It just looks kind of ugly and muddy, like down here is especially noticeable. So as I start to raise this, those artifacts will disappear. So you want to bring this up to a setting that gets rid of the artifacts, uh, but isn't necessarily too high because the, the higher you make the setting, uh, it can affect the, the way the, the surfaces look. If I brought this up to a thousand, the reflections look a little bit different. So maybe bring this up to, let's just do a setting of one for the scene. And it's going to vary depending on the scene that you're rendering. The filter size adds a certain amount of blurring as a way to eliminate or reduce noise. If you set it too high, of course, your scene's going to look very soft. So it looks like everything's out of focus. So we want to keep this to a reasonable level in order to eliminate noise, but not make the scene look too soft. The default setting 1.2 is, is usually pretty good for most scenes. So to demonstrate some of the other aspects of the global illumination settings within Octane for Cinema 4D, I've switched over to the Cantina.C4D scene, which is an interior, shows this uh, pilot and a robot hanging out at a bar together. And uh, if we go to the GI mode, as I mentioned before, if I set this to none, you can see the scene looks very dark because we don't have a lot of light bouncing around within the shadows. Set this to ambient occlusion. We can start to see a little bit more lightness in the shadows here as light is bouncing around. And we can also check out the AO distance, which determines how far the spread is for the ambient occlusion. So if I bring this up, you should start to see more darkening in the shadows. If I bring it all the way down, we see less. A great way to test this is to turn on irradiance mode, which kind of eliminates the textures and allows us just to see how the light is bouncing around within the scene. So if I have irradiance mode on and I set the AO distance really low, you don't see a lot of that ambient occlusion spreading. As I increase it, now you start to see more of it darkening in the shadows. And then if I set this to diffuse, in this case, you see the lighting starts to look a little bit more interesting. And then we can control the spread using the diffuse depth. So if I increase this, we're going to get more and more diffuse bounces. Bring it all the way down to see this kind of dark uh, view of the shadows because there's not a lot of light bouncing and getting into the shadows. Let's bring this up to five for this particular scene and I'll turn off irradiance mode. Both the path termination power and coherent ratio settings, if you raise them, can speed up the render, but they can also introduce noise. So path termination power, if you start to increase this, you might get more noise in the shadow areas. And the coherent ratio, again, you can this can help to speed up the render but may introduce kind of a blotchy quality. So again, depends on the scene and what you're trying to accomplish, but you can always give those a try, see if they help speed up the render time. You can see this is starting to look kind of really weird over here in these lit areas if I raise this too high. The static noise option means that the noise pattern that you see will be the same from one frame to another if you're uh, rendering an animation or batch render. Uh, which could look a little bit weird. It might reduce some time, especially good if you're doing like a test uh, animation or something like that. It could reduce render time, but it might look as though there's like some kind of gauze or something like that in front of the lens. So be careful when using this option. The parallel samples and max tile sample settings won't actually affect the look of the render. These can help speed up the render, but it depends on the architecture of your machine. 
So if you have powerful graphics cards on your machine or multiple graphics cards, you can try raising these and see if they, they see if they reduce the render time, but they shouldn't affect the look of the render in any way, just how fast it renders. The minimized net traffic uh, setting uh, is only goes into effect if you're actually network rendering. So if, if you're using several GPUs across the network, uh, this will affect those settings. So we'll talk about that when we're talking about network rendering. And we also have a separate movie that uh, is focused on adaptive sampling. So I'm not going to cover those options here. Uh, th these options are also found in the other render kernels. I've switched back to the muscle ship scene and I've added an Octane Sky with an HDRI image so that you can see sort of clouds in the background here. This is just to demonstrate some of the alpha options. Alpha shadows, you should leave this on most of the time. It just means that any object that has a shader that might have a alpha map in the opacity channel just means that the shadows are calculated correctly for that. So most of the time it's a good idea to leave this on. If I turn on alpha channel, we'll see an alpha channel appears. If we look in the alpha right here. Again, we have an alpha channel, so that'll looks good. If I turn on keep environment, it should keep the environment in the image, but you see it's not doing that here. However, uh, I saved out a version as an EXR earlier and opened it up in Photoshop just to show that, you know, we have an alpha channel here. It's been saved with the EXR image, but if I take a look in the RGB, we can see that the background is still there. So it appears in the image, but we also have an alpha channel that does not have it. So that's the basics of working with the direct lighting kernel in Octane for Cinema 4D. In the next movie, we'll take a look at working with the path tracing kernel.